In Pakistan, these young girls face an uncertain future. It's a wedding, but the men and women don't mix, and the bride remains upstairs, out of sight. Many men here don't permit their wives to ever leave the house. The women can virtually disappear. In most Pakistani households, the husband's authority is absolute. Outside a private charity in Karachi, a baby's cot stands in the street. The sign on it pleads with mothers to put their babies in the cot rather than kill them. It's usually baby girls who are quietly murdered. In many areas, it's a traditional practice, recognized and even encouraged. In 1979, the late President Zia introduced Islamic law into Pakistan. For women here, it's meant they face a host of discriminatory laws. On the streets of rural villages, you don't see many women. Veiled or unveiled, she's under pressure to stay out of sight. In this society, a uh, woman is considered very much the property of uh, men. And uh, that uh, is the way a girl is treated from day one that unless she conforms to the family's dictates, she is considered rebellious and an outcast. Some of those who do rebel wind up here at the Karachi North Insane Asylum for Women. According to the doctor here, most of these women lost their sanity after cruelty and abuse from husbands or families. In Pakistan, stress and overwork cause women to die on average younger than men. Of the 1,200 women here and their children, Many appeared quite normal. The doctor said this 15-year-old girl was healthy. Her parents had brought her here saying she'd become uncontrollable when her arranged marriage was discussed. Others wanted to know why they were being detained. <laughs> Those in charge admit it's hard to separate the truly insane from the healthy but largely run by cured inmates and with only one psychiatrist for all 1,200 women, it's a system which is open to easy abuse. Many of the problems faced by women arise from men marrying more than once. This house is said to deal in slave girls. The buyers are mostly older married men. We were told that up to 3,000 girls can be on sale on Karachi streets each day. In this show house run by a private charity, slave girls have found opulence after a nightmare. At the Clifton Home for Girls, many were lured or kidnapped from their homes in Bangladesh and brought to Pakistan to be sold. Amna was 10 years old when she was trapped into going with the slave traders. He threatened me and said, I'll tie you up in the room. I'll kill you. Maybe I'll strangle you. Nobody would ever know. They didn't treat me well. They would beat me. The food was not good and I was fed only twice a day. Even when Amna finally escaped, the first two men she asked for help tried to capture and sell her. Thank God the last man sent me to the Eddie girl's home. If I hadn't come here, they would have gone on selling me, and they would have wrecked my life. A group of lawyers are trying to bring the slave trade to a halt. They say more than 200,000 girls have been traded in the last 10 years, and that the authorities don't want it to stop. Pakistan government is doing nothing. It's not a simple trafficking. It's the complete mafia with the support of the border police as well as the local police. So they are all involved in it and they are getting their you see, uh, share. Whenever the girl has been sold, the share will go to the in charge of the police station and the uh, small policemen who are looking after that area and that has been protected by the police. I gave a runaway slave girl refuge. After a while, the police came with a pimp she was taken away by the police, who then gave her back to the pimps. They sold her. Many other freed slavery victims are arrested and wind up in women's prisons like this. Though the authorities like it to be called a home for runaway women, 
Everyone here is locked up and can't leave without a court order. Fatima was arrested after she was brought to Pakistan. Her pimp went free. Once arrested, slave girls are often charged under the adultery laws. Though she's been acquitted, she's still not free. I stayed in the pimp's house for a month before the police arrested me. Then I was sent to jail, and I've been in jail for two and a half years. The judge acquitted me. What police do whenever they make raids or they, they, uh, they recover some of the girls, they arrest some pimps. So instead of making that woman as a star witness of the prosecution in the case, they make, you see, the, the women also as an accused under the Zina ordinance. And then she will be in prison. But not only freed slaves are imprisoned under the Zina adultery laws. These women are here for fling arranged marriages, escaping cruel husbands, even for having been raped. In Pakistan, rape victims are considered accessories to the crime. Rape requires four male witnesses, otherwise the victim's likely to be locked up. Most of them are innocent. They don't know what is happening. When we meet them, sometimes they say, if you ask them, well, what have you been here? What's happened to you? What have you done wrong? So she says, well, uh, I just don't know. I didn't agree to marry. I didn't like that fellow. Or he wanted to rape me. I just made a racket and I ran away. And I've been trapped and put here. Privately, police told us their hands are full without having to worry about the Zina laws. But they say the law is the law and they're just upholding it. Why do you imprison someone who's been raped against their will? Well, under Islamic law, you can be charged whether or not you did it willingly. In the Karachi High Court cells, women wait for their Zina cases to be heard alongside hardened male convicts. Rukhaya Khan is in prison because she won't marry the man her parents want her to. She's in love with another. Now, her parents have laid a charge of zina against her, and she won't be released unless they withdraw it. My parents didn't want me to get an education. They thought I'd become morally corrupt because our school had both boys and girls. They thought I'd run away with a boy, so they arranged a marriage for me. This was how the antagonism started. It's too easy to blame only Islam for the position of women's rights in Pakistan. Religious leaders say that Islam prohibits both men and women from premarital sex and that the Quran instructs these boys to respect their female brethren and to give them freedom of choice in marriage. But it is the fundamental belief that women belong at home which justifies much of the discrimination here. She doesn't need any job in the society. She should uh, remain in home and try to rear up her children, which is the next generation. And she, she, she should not uh, unnecessarily go to the society, unnecessarily. At the end of the day, like any other city, Karachi's nightlife awakens. This is a brothel where men commit adultery every night. The girls are licensed to dance, but everyone knows what really happens. In Pakistan, there are hundreds of brothels like it. Campaigners say it's time for women to confront the system. There must be a push to raise the awareness of women about their rights and to make them much more aggressive uh, in demanding a full share. As the call for women's rights whips up, they're not totally deaf to it here. In this region, men dominated women long before Islam arrived. And it's perhaps the depth of ancient desert law which makes sexual equality in Pakistan still a distant dream.